Due to COVID-19, we were unable to properly recognize Wilbur Jackson and John Mitchell's accomplishments in person on the campus of the University of Alabama. This video has been created to honor their sacrifices and accomplishments while we anxiously await celebrating them when we are all safely able to do so. 50 years ago, Wilbur Jackson and John Mitchell broke barriers and changed the course of the Alabama football program forever. This is their story. In 1963, George Wallace stood outside the schoolhouse door at Foster Auditorium, refusing to allow African-American students to register for classes at the University of Alabama. The unwelcomed, unwanted, unwarranted, and force-induced intrusion upon the campus of the University of Alabama, the day of the might of the central government, offers frightful examples of the oppression of the rights, privileges, and sovereignty of this state by officers of the federal government. In the late 1950s and throughout the 60s, Alabama played against many teams with African-American players. But progress at Alabama would take time. As times changed, Alabama recognized that African-American athletes should be given equal education and athletic opportunities. Under the leadership of Coach Paul Bear Bryant, Alabama made the decision that it was time to move forward with the addition of African-American players to the Alabama football program. Wilbur Jackson and John Mitchell's recruitment changed the Alabama football program forever. I had three recruiting trips to the university, and each time I talked to Coach Bryant, you know, like all the other recruits did. But one night at his house, he took me to the side and he said, if you come here, can't promise you everything is going to be smooth, but if you ever have a problem, just come and see me don't go and see anyone else, come and see me, and we'll do the best that we can to take care of it. And I think the university offered me a scholarship midway through my senior year here at Carroll. There was a sense of pride, especially in my neighborhood, you know. It was like everybody pointed to me, and they would tell their kids, that, look at Wilbur, you know, he's doing this, and, and if he can do it, then you can do the same thing as well. Well, it was five, of students that I was in school with, uh, we entered the science fair right there in Mobile. It was the first time in the history of Mobile that five black kids from an all-black school won it. And when we went to South Carolina for the National High School Science Convention, uh, we came in third. And here are five black kids from an all-black school, and we're offered academic scholarships to basically all the southern schools but none of us accepted those i went to junior college in arizona because i wanted to play football in that particular time alabama in the south but didn't have any uh, black athletes even with john's high academic standing and multiple academic scholarship offers he decided to pursue football at the junior college level when I played at junior college, I played at Eastern Arizona, and there was a school in Yuman called Western Arizona. Well, my college coach in Eastern did not recommend me to Southern Cal. The guy at Western Arizona did, because I guess every time we played them, I played pretty well against those guys. I had signed to go to Southern Cal, and John McKay was boasting that he was gonna sign a black player from Mobile, Alabama. Alabama had never watched me play. They didn't know who I was. The only thing they knew about me was my name. They looked in the phone book and called every John Mitchell in the phone book until they got my father. <laughs> he was John Mitchell, see? So they got my father and told uh, him who they were. And the following week, Coach Bryant, first quarterback at Alabama, Bobby Jackson, drove me, my mom, my dad up to Alabama. And that's when I made the decision to come to Alabama visiting with Coach Bryant. As a kid, whether you were black, white, brown, or yellow, hey, you knew about Alabama football. And I said, if I go to Alabama, well, my parents gonna have a chance to see me play. And that was the biggest and best decision I made. When they come down to making a, making a deciding what school you were going to go to, that I was going to go to, it was Alabama or no place, because I was offered one scholarship, and that was at Alabama. In 1970, 
Paul Bear Bryant would offer a scholarship to Wilbur Jackson to play football at the University of Alabama. Jackson would become the first African-American player to receive a scholarship for the Crimson Tide football team. Wilbur Jackson was from Ozark, Alabama, and is and was one of the most humble human beings you have ever met. And you couldn't get a, hardly a word out of Wilbur, but when you did, you know, it was, it was, he, he always had a smile on his face. Wilbur was a great player, very quiet. We used to tease him all the time because he would stay in the TV room, look at TV cartoons all day. Wilbur loved, loved to hang out in his dorm room, and he watched all those old corny, uh, uh, you know, serials like Andy Griffin and all of that, and has a little TV. But when you watched him at practice and how he approached practice, how he approached the game, he was the ultimate teammate. And I, and I, I, I tried to do and walk in the same footsteps of, of Wilbur. He was a, a shifty guy that would have good size and good speed. And so, you know, if you didn't center up on him, keep a good base, you're gonna miss him. And then occasionally, if you if you were light in your, light in your shoes, he would run you over as well. The day Wilbur stepped on campus, he just commanded that respect uh, because he was such a fine person. And I can remember one day, Wilbur had a bad day at practice like we all do, and he fumbled the ball, he didn't jump on it. And John David went to Coach Bryant and said, well, we need to teach him a lesson. Hey, guys from the ball got to jump on. So they stopped practicing and they lined up every defensive player and Wilbur had to run the ball, a little gauntlet, one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, Wilbur, don't quit because I'll be here by myself. Don't quit. <laughs> don't quit. I said, whatever you got to do. And he made it through it and made him a better football player. And Wilbur never had another form in his career. Like all freshmen at that time, Wilbur Jackson was not allowed to play on the varsity as a freshman, but Jackson got a first-hand look from the stands in 1970 when USC and Sam Cunningham dismantled the Crimson Tide 42 to 21 at Legion Field. Well, going into the game, I thought we'd have a shootout, like a 37, 34 type thing, you know, and whoever had the ball last uh, would likely win the game, but as the got into the game, it was obvious that they were a stronger, bigger, and faster football team than we were across the board. Of course, uh, they dominated. You got a team here that come into Legion Field that had probably 40, 50 percent of their players were players of color, and their quarterback was Jimmy Jones, you know, a black guy. So there was a sense of pride in that. I'm a homer, so I'm pulling for Bama. But when those guys run on to the field, it was just a sense of pride. Everybody getting the chance to look down there and see the great athletes of Southern Cal, I think they had 18 or 20 on their team that were black, and how well they, Sam Cunningham, Clarence Davis, whose, I think, grandparents were from Birmingham, uh, see those players and how good they were. Shortly after the 1970 season, John Mitchell would also join the team the NCAA would enact a rule that would allow for an 11th game and the Crimson Tide and the USC Trojans would agree to face off again to begin the 1971 season. This time with Jackson and Mitchell available to play. And it worked that when we played Southern Cal in 71 from the, for the first game, I had worked my way up to the depth chart and you know, I didn't know I was gonna start and I started that night. Richard Williamson was my coach and I won't forget this and it brought tears to my eyes and I might get a little teary here. Uh, his father passed that week and we flew out to Southern Cal on a Friday and you know at Southern Cal at that time in the dressing room they had those little cubicles where you, where you had. And I'm sitting in that cubicle before the game and I said, boy, who, who in the heck gonna coach me? I mean, and about a half an hour before kickoff, Richard Williamson put his head in the little cubicle and said, I'm here. And it really brought tears to my eyes because he had just buried his father and he flew out to Southern Cal to be with the team. And it meant a lot to me. Going to Southern, to Los Angeles to play Southern Cal my sophomore year. And we won that game. First game with the wishbone. After a hard fought battle, the Crimson Tide came out victorious with a 17 to 10 victory over the Trojans. After the game, you come in for a team prayer but Coach Bryant prayed, and there were a lot of the 
seniors and juniors that had been there before, some of those guys were crying. And I didn't understand. But over the next three years that I was there, Coach Bryant, after the game, we would have a team prayer. But Coach Bryant only prayed maybe four times. So it had to be something really big or special for Coach Bryant to pray. And those guys that were crying, they knew that. They had been there. And it was just, you know, one of those things. When he prayed, it was something, it meant something to him. Well, you know, when, when John and, and Weber integrated Alabama, history was being made. Uh, because I don't think that that was very many black athletes was playing in the South. When Wilbur got that scholarship, along with Wendell Hudson uh, in basketball, which was a year before, that was a game changer. That opened it up for all the, the young black athletes that was growing up in the state of Alabama, growing up in the South. Now that opportunity to go to Alabama was there for us. I felt like that I could have been the next Wilbur Jackson. And I look forward to, to the opportunity of being recruited by most of the major causes in, 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 in America. And when I realized that I had that opportunity, it just motivated, motivated me to dig a little bit deeper. You know, their struggles helped pave the way for not just us, but a lot of people around the country. You know, made it more normal to have African Americans along with other races intermingle on the same team. So if they were here, I just told them thank you because it's provided me with a world of opportunities to better my life. If I had to pick out a word, it would be, like I said, courageous. Um, because it took courage to understand the weight of that decision. I think they were just looking forward down the road and knew this opportunity would be something that would live beyond the game. And, and here we are today, um, honoring them and talking about them still 50 years later. And the modeling that they showed, the role models that they were on the field and off the field, really did advance, I think, our institutional thoughts and actions around issues related to diversity. When Coach Bryant took a chance on those two, America woke up and realized the opportunity that, 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 that had been denied. And when Coach Bryant did it, most of America realized if it was good enough for Coach Bryant, then it's good enough for us. I'm extremely grateful because of what they did. They were like the pioneers. That moment opened up so many opportunities down the road for like a lot of other black athletes. Both of those men though are class men. I mean, they conduct themselves class, class guys. I mean, it's easy to be a teammate to a guy like that. After John's football playing career came to an end, he rejoined Coach Bryant's staff at Alabama, becoming the first African-American coach in the program's history. I was really, really considering going to Auburn. Uh, John Mitchell called and, and asked me if he could come up and uh, spend a day with me and go to dinner, and we did. And when I sat down with John at dinner, I just knew it was something different. And at that point, uh, I, I changed my mind. I told John I wanted to go to Alabama. If these young men had not emboldened themselves to say, I know I can do it, had the support of their family and community, which I'm confident was like, go! Because that's how we do as a community. How much would we have lost as a nation, even in terms of the quality of, of, of football? Taking that first step is always the hard part, but once they were able to get in, they were able to make the changes that they needed to. The impact Wilbur Jackson and John Mitchell had on African Americans at Alabama and around the world is nothing short of extraordinary. But neither player would realize at the time how significant playing for the Crimson Tide would be. 50 years has gone by like a blink of an eye. You know, it doesn't feel like it, but it does, but it has. And I think if, if, if there was anything that I could say, it mean that guys that go there now when they, are being, when they are being recruited by so many different schools and they're deciding on what school to go to, if Alabama is in the equation, they don't have to worry about whether I'm gonna be treated fairly or if I'm gonna get a shot. With those people making the changes and the sacrifices that they made, it gave us all the opportunities in the world. 
we see that there are people before us who helped pave the way for us and it's sort of our jobs to continue the legacy if we have the opportunity. I just want to uphold that standard that they set back then. I want to be uh, a classy person and a person who's uh, well respected by my program and my teammates. And so I just want to uphold the legacy. I have a commitment. Have a commitment in what you want to do. I think a lot of athletes right now want to go to college and play football and in the back of their mind they want a big professional contract. But go enjoy college life. Be a part of college life. I heard somebody ask Coach Bryant uh, after a game, you know, uh, what is class? He said, I can't tell you what is class, but I know it when I see it. Coach Bryant would always tell his players, whatever you do, do it with class. And that is something that stood up with me for a long time. You know, I, I want to represent myself well, and I want to represent my parents well, but I want to represent the University of Alabama well because they were very good to me. Alabama has since had thousands of African-American players earn full ride scholarships and hundreds more drafted into the NFL draft. The Miami Dolphins select Minka Fitzpatrick. The New York Jets select Quinnen Williams. Alabama, Josh Jacobs. Alabama. <laughs> hey, there it is, the Raiders take Josh Jacobs. John Mitchell is entering his 27th season as assistant head coach with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He is the longest tenured coach on the staff. So when I came up, all I heard stories was, you know, you got to be like your cousin John. You know, going up to Alabama, he's one of the first blacks to go up there. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, There's some big shoes to fill. With him opening the doors that he opened up, that I think he pretty much let everybody know the sky's the limit. Wilbur Jackson is retired and enjoying his life in Ozark, Alabama. To this day, Jackson still holds the Alabama career record for yards per rush. 50 years have passed by, but the impact of integration with the Alabama football team will live forever. Especially once my daughter got there because I remember when she was about six years old, I took her over to dinner chimes and I found my name in the cement and I called her over. And she uh, comes over and she looks at it and she goes, Daddy, that's your name? And I said, yeah, baby. Daddy was uh, okay. To Wilbur and John, we honor you and thank you for taking a chance and paving the way for so many.